I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. I was, I, I think I shared a little bit about this last week, but I actually was in Charleston um, at Folly Beach when Hurricane Lee was just a few hundred miles off the coast. And um, I, I, one of the things I love to do is to get up really early and to try to get out there and see the sunrise. Like, it, I think it's just one of the most beautiful experiences. And, and, um, and so I, I tried to get out there and I was amazed. I got out there about 6.40 in the morning. I was amazed when I got got out to the beach to look out and probably see 50 to 75 surfers who were already out in the water. I mean, they were lined up um, several yards off the coast. They were lined up and they were waiting for the next wave. Uh, but I was just, I was stunned. They beat me to the beach, you know? I mean, they beat me out there and they'd been out there and they were ready. And probably surfers who, I, I know that particular area is known as a, a surfer town, but probably because of that hurricane, that storm that was off the coast, there were surfers who drove in from all over to try to catch that next wave. Now, one of the things I noticed was in order to catch that next wave and to get any kind of lift off of that, you had to get pretty far out there, right? Pretty far. When I go, I try to be very careful how far I go out into the ocean for a number of reasons, and particularly with that storm out there, the rip current was really, really strong. And the second reason was because of sharks, right? I mean, just let's be honest, right? My son and I have a running joke that like, we try not to go out where there's not very many people because we don't want to be the first bait in, um, in, in the water. But I noticed these surfers were way out there. They went out into the deeper water to catch a bigger wave to catch, I think the waves were like five to seven feet high. They were, they were big waves that they were catching. They had to take a risk. They had to get out and be prepared to go further out. And they were waiting for that next big race, a wave. The reality is that in order for us to do this with our faith, to get deeper into our faith, there are some things that we have to do and it's just like whether you're, you're going to run a race or you're, or you're, you're preparing to, to ride a, on a bike trail or whatever it is, you have to do some preparation. You have to do some work to, to get further along in that. And unless we're willing to take the deep dive to go further, a lot of times we will stay in the shallow waters of our faith. What I hope will happen over these next few weeks I hope that you will not just stop with the messages that we talk about on Sunday mornings, but together we will seek and go deeper into the scriptures we talk about. I hope you'll take advantage of the dinner and a group opportunities that will start next Sunday night, October 8th at 5 p.m. And if you can't be in a group, maybe your schedule doesn't allow you, I, I hope that you'll be a part of another group. I hope you'll find a way and if you'd like to, actually one of the things that we are starting to do and have been doing is we take, and there's a discussion video that we create every week and put on our YouTube channel that you can actually follow along with and have questions that prompt you to go deeper into the message. But this series that is called Deeper is really aimed at this. For us to have a deeper a richer, a fuller understanding of the faith we, those of us who claim to follow Jesus and claim Jesus' name on our lives. For those of you who, who are not followers of Jesus, you're here because maybe it's, it's, a, it's a great group to be a part of. I, I think it is. 
You found what seems to be your people here, and I think that's awesome, or something else just keeps drawing you here. Let me tell you, first of all, if that is you, I am really glad you are here. Second, my hope is that maybe, just maybe, you'd be willing to hear something in what we will talk about that might help you make a decision and give your life to Jesus. I personally think that that would be the most important thing you could ever do in your life, is to give your life to Jesus. Now, we chose the letter of Ephesians to look at over these next few weeks because it begins with some of the basic stuff, but it really explains why we believe what we believe. It explains the how that it all ties together in a bigger picture of what is going on beyond just the here and now. <clears throat> Ephesians is about how there's a much larger story of God that has been unfolding even before the beginning of what we know of as time, and how this good, generous, loving creator God pursues his beloved creation. It's a very different kind of concept of a God than what we see in, in Greek mythology or in the Avenger movies. <laughs> This is not a God who is playing chess with people. This is not a God who is carrying around a lightning bolt ready to zap people who get out of line. This is a God. This is a God who is in three distinct persons, whose very being is at the center of everything that it means to even exist. And the letter of Ephesians which most scripture experts believe was written by the Apostle Paul. The, the actual letter was probably intended to be used by many different churches, but the one that we look at and we read has Ephesians attached to it, probably because the church in Ephesus attached it to their church. In fact, the main heart of our whole series that we're going to study and go through over the next six weeks. We can find in Ephesians chapter 3 when the Apostle Paul says this in verse 16 and 17. This was on that video that just played. I pray that God from his, God's, God the Father's glorious, unlimited resources. He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Let's read this last line together. Can you read this last sentence? Here we go, everybody. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. That's the goal of this whole series. That's the goal of the groups that we'll be having on Sunday nights, that we will have roots that go deeper and draw us into a deeper relationship with God, all right? So we're gonna start with Ephesians chapter one in a section of chapter one. If you wanna go there in your Bibles or if you wanna follow along on the screen, Ephesians chapter one, verses one and two, just real quick, they are an intro so we're, we're not gonna actually spend any time. It's an introduction to who Paul is, and if you wanna read that sometime, you can do that. He explains just a little bit about himself. Verse three, though, this is what Paul says in this letter. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Can you say united with Christ, ready? United with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us, say, in Christ, in Christ, to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Now, this particular text, along with others in the New Testament, have been at the heart of a lot of debate in a lot of different circles. It's a really hot topic that some people get sidetracked with. And it has to do with this word predestination. Some think that God has already got it all figured out 
who's in and who's out. I'll just be upfront with you. I'm not a debater, all right? That's never been one of my strong points. I have no interest in getting into arguments with people in person or online. I will listen to different viewpoints, but I have come to my own conclusions about this scripture based off the perspectives in my own tradition and even how I have come to view who Jesus is. And what I see here and and what I have read and understood and researched and and come to believe, what Paul is saying here, just like he says at the, the, like like it says, just like it says at the very beginning of the whole Bible back in Genesis, God created humans in such a way that we were like Jesus to begin with. But God gave us free will. And because God loved us and wanted to create beings with the ability to love him back, because real love is risky. But because of love, God decided no matter what we did, he would not stop loving us. Thank you, John. I'm gonna try that for everybody else now. All right, you can get in on what what John got in on. God decided from the very beginning that no matter what we did, he would not stop loving us. So from the start, God's grace was extended to humankind before humankind even knew it. (laughs) A little something we call prevenient grace in some circles. But here's why this is important. Because if we see God in this light, if we recognize that God created us with the purpose of loving him back, if we recognize that God created us to be co-creators, right? In Genesis, go and multiply, he says, to the man and the woman, right? Be co-creators. If we recognize that God gave stewardship and responsibility to care for creation, that's what he did. And all of this, as Paul says, gave God so much pleasure. Here's here's my first point. God has chosen us for a purpose. Even if you were to go back to Genesis and look at the story of, of God choosing a man named Abraham, the great father of the people of Israel, the one who God had called to start a new race of people out of, God promises Abraham that he would make his, his, his descendants more numerous than Abraham could even count. But he would do this with a purpose. <laughs> They would be a people who would love God back because they were his people. And God would bless the world through him. They would be a reminder of God's love. And and now Paul is saying, this is what God has done now through Jesus Christ. This is what God's people are supposed to do to bless the world. God will bless the world through us. God has given us a purpose. God has given us a purpose for every area of our lives, for every moment that we might come in contact with people, thinking about how God blesses the world. This, this week I went to lunch with someone, and we were, we were just getting together and catching up. I was having lunch with Tony Cirillo, Pastor Tony. And as we sat there and were talking, our waitress came up to us, and if you know Tony, Tony gives everybody a hard time. So he gave the waitress a hard time. And you could tell she was really connecting with, with Tony. And she, she said, well, what's your name? And he said, my name is Tony. And she said, that's my dad's name. He said, oh, really? He said, well, tell your dad he's a good person because that's a great name, <laughs> right? And she said, well, my dad and I are not in, really good, in a really good relationship right now. My dad doesn't approve of the relationship that I'm in with my boyfriend. And she said, it's really hard. She said, my heart is broken. I mean, she just started to pour out her heart right there. And I had a chance just to talk with her a little bit more and and talk about what it means to be a dad and how dads and daughters and and kids and, and that relationship and how hard it is at times. And I was able, at the end of our conversation, I said, can I just pray with you for a moment? And she said, absolutely. And she bent down and we, we, we just prayed right there, me, Tony, and her. 
And when she got done, she said, I needed this today. I needed this today. God blesses the world through us. God has chosen us for a purpose. Let's keep going. This is what Paul continues to say in Ephesians, picking up in verse seven. Speaking of God, Paul writes, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is his plan. I love it. Here we go. We get, to, we get in on the plan. Ready? At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. God's not done. <laughs> Here's my point number two. God has chosen us through Jesus. This concept of, of the blood of Jesus, we, we sing about it, we talk about it at communion. And I know that, that at times, if you really thought about it, it can seem foreign because it's a different kind of language. But here's where this comes from. When the, when the people of Israel were, were in Egypt and they had been slaves for 400 years and, and, and God sends Moses, this great leader, to go back in and, and to lead them out when Moses confronts the, the king of Israel or king of Egypt, Pharaoh, Pharaoh refuses to let him go. He won't let his slaves go. He won't let the people who were running the economy underneath the, the load of, of their captive captors. He won't let them go. And so God sends these plagues, and there's this there's this tension and this this wrestling and this struggle between Pharaoh and Moses, really it's between Pharaoh and God. Ultimately it comes down to the end and God has had enough and he's going to move and God is going, his presence is going to move up on the land of Egypt. And so he tells the people of Israel, he says for them to, to get a goat or a lamb. It needs to be one that, that has no, no problems. It needs to be in good condition. And it needs to be a male. And they had to take in there to sacrifice that animal. And with some of the blood from that animal, they're to take it and they're to put it on the doorpost of their house. And what God instructs them is that when his presence comes through that land, anyone who has the blood on the doorpost will be safe and saved. This is where this concept comes from. It took this harsh act to break the Egyptian king's hold on the people. What this ends up becoming is called the Passover time. The same animal that they take some of that blood from, then they take and they have a meal that night with that this all unfolds. And what happens is over time Israel remembers and they, they celebrate the Passover. They celebrate God showing up because what happens is the Egyptian king relents and lets go because there's so much death in Egypt from those who are not saved. This would become known as Passover for the Jewish people. And when Jesus comes and shows up on the scene, it says in, in the book of John chapter one, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The writer of Hebrews writes this. So Christ has become the high priest over all the good things that have come, right? He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. Listen here. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most high, holy place once and for all time. 
and secured our redemption forever. Forever. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says this, and so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus, right? And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, here it is, who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You see what happens there? That's why it matters that Jesus went to the cross. Let's, let's go back to Ephesians 1 and finish out this section, picking it up in verse 11. Paul says, furthermore, because we are Say this together, ready? United with Christ. Let's do that together, one more time, ready? United with Christ, all right? We have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we, because Paul is a Jew, or was a Jew, we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth. That's us, everybody, Gentiles, right here. The good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this, let's read this last line together, it's too important, all right? Here we go, ready? He did this so we would praise and glorify him. All right, now, so an inheritance, that word inheritance is in here, and the idea of an inheritance in ancient times would be so much more than just money. It would oftentimes include land and even family responsibilities. And even today, the idea of, of wanting to leave an inheritance for future generations is about being generous and giving, giving of your, of your own life, right? The life you have to those who will come after you, similar to what we talked about in Legacy Sunday last week. But what Paul is saying is that out of God's goodness and God's generosity, out of God's kindness, out of the depths of, of God's amazing love for his creation, he has made a way for us to share in his own life. I'm telling you, this is a different kind of God than the one that's made up by a lot of people. This is a God who wants us to have a promise of an eternal existence. Once... We were lost, but now he has found us. Amen. And he wants us to be part of his life. Last point here, God has chosen us to share in his life. Throughout this whole section here, we see that we bring pleasure and joy and, and happiness to God. You ever thought about that? When we believe in Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus, when we, we set our eyes and our hearts on Jesus, it brings so much joy to the one who created us. And through Jesus, we can actually share in God's own life. We have a future with God because of Jesus. And we have a taste of that future because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. A taste of that future. The Holy Spirit helps us to have a taste of heaven, a taste of God's presence in our lives. The Holy Spirit helps us to see it and to feel it and to know it. 
And there will be a day. There will be a day when we will experience it fully in the future. This is the promise of God. So what do we do now? What do we do with this understanding, right? Like, what do we do in response to being chosen by God, the creator of the whole universe, who before we were even created had so much love for us, so much love for us. Listen, God's love is incomprehensible without Jesus. I'm gonna say that one more time. God's love is incomprehensible without Jesus. But because of Jesus, we can see the love that God has had for us from the beginning of time. And what does it mean to know that you can actually be so loved, so valued by the very one who gave you life? Yes, with all of our baggage, with all of our rebelliousness, with all of our failures, God has made a way for us to be a part of, I, I love this, I don't know where I got the phrase forever family, but this is what God has done. He's made a way for us to be a part of his forever family. He has made a way for us to come home. And the way is Jesus to help us grow closer and closer. And the more we know and experience the presence of God, the more we know even about ourselves. But that's not really even the point. That's a great, that's a great add-on. At the end of the day, though, the point is we can know this God who is so creative, who is so profoundly wonderful, who has, who has at the center of his heart a desire to love his creation that he has called good. All of life, all of life has come right out of the love of God. Listen, here's my last one, or last add-on here. All of life is about God, and this God-centered life is found in Jesus Christ found in Jesus Christ. As a, as a foreign concept in our world, where we think the universe revolves around us, or we want to, the reality is God is at the center of it all. And the sooner we realize that and recognize that, the sooner that we trust Jesus to experience it the more and more we begin to see and experience the purpose the peace and the hope that is found in this God. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment. God has chosen us for a purpose. God has chosen us through Jesus. God has chosen us to share in his life. Here's the deal though. You know and I know that just because you're chosen doesn't mean that you accept it. And God's not going to force himself on anybody. God is inviting us to embrace, to embrace this purpose he has for us, to embrace this love he has for us. So I want to give you a moment, give you a chance today to respond. What does it mean to you to be chosen? What does it mean to you to know that God has a purpose for your life? What does it mean to you to know 
and to recognize and to realize what Jesus has done for you. How will you respond today? Maybe today you need to start with Jesus and you need to say yes to Jesus and give your life to him. So let's take a moment right now. If you are in that, at that point in your journey, would you say this prayer? Jesus, I give you my life. I confess my need for the forgiveness of my sins. I trust that you do forgive me and I receive your love. Today, if that was your prayer, you can have confidence First of all, that God answers your prayer today. He answers your prayer with forgiveness and a new beginning.